my windows taken care of here. Okay, so I'm, I'm excited to present to you how plant microbe interactions influence the sustainability of bioenergy cropping systems. And I know, as Don had mentioned, um, that the IGB themes uh, span a lot of different uh, disciplines. And so I'm going to start out with a bit of an overview about sustainability and uh, the reason why uh, we even want to develop bioenergy cropping systems. Um, so uh, CABI has a really large footprint at the University of Illinois and at IGB, but um, we're also more than just uh, the University of Illinois. We have 23 partner institutions and uh, many, many faculty level researchers, graduate and undergraduate students, postdoctoral researchers and technicians um, all across the country. So um, the, one of the big motivations for my research program um, is the fact that our agricultural advances have increased crop yields um, through mechanization of land management, through crop breeding, through fertilizer and pesticide applications. Um, but that's come at the expense of other ecosystem services. Um, so this, these flower diagrams here show um, the production of these different categories of ecosystem services with the yellow petals indicating uh, the level of production of a particular ecosystem service. So you can see that as we go from natural ecosystems to a conventional agroecosystem, we, we lose a lot of our uh, uh, ecosystem services uh, in favor of crop production. So the goal of uh, developing a sustainable agroecosystem is both from the ecological and economic perspective. So we want to regain some of the, these ecosystem services such as greenhouse gas mitigation, carbon sequestration, nutrient use efficiency and retention. But we can't do that um, by sacrificing crop production because it still needs to be economically sustainable. So we have to come up with systems where we can um, either maintain or potentially even enhance crop production while we're enhancing the production of these other ecosystem services. And bioenergy cropping systems show promise as a sustainable alternative on lands that are marginal for corn soy production. And so because the world is uh, facing a growing human population, we, we can't um, take land out of food production, but there are lands that are less productive or less consistently productive uh, for corn soy uh, production and the production of uh, uh, foods. And so, for example, um, these uh, there are different uh, biophysical reasons for lands to be marginal, um, but one of the reasons is that uh, the sometimes the soil conditions uh, the the um, the topography or the, the soil texture can lead to uh, waterlogged soil conditions in a particular um, area. And so this is showing one of the fields on uh, the energy farm where we saw a gradient across our field of uh, relatively well-drained soils down to this poorly drained area. And um, my postdocs, Adam von Hayden and Mark Burnham uh, led a study uh, in which they assessed across a transect from the wet end of this field um, towards the drier end, uh, the yield of sorghum, our bioenergy crop, compared to maize. And so you can see this relative yield that the maize does really poorly on the wet end of, of the field, but the sorghum um, still maintains about 50% of, of the yield and even you know, just 15 meters from this very wettest portion um, is essentially able to recover um, the yield. And this is due to better establishment. Um, so on the right side here, you can see uh, the maize um, germination rate was just lower compared to the sorghum germination rate. Um, but also there's more phenotypic plasticity with the sorghum. So there was more tillering. The sorghum was able to take advantage of the um, greater light availability with having a uh, uh, a little bit sparser uh, plant establishment uh, compared to the maize. Um, we see this also with um, miscanthus, which is a perennial uh, grass, uh, also grown as a bioenergy feedstock. So kind of in the shadow of this really tall miscanthus, you can see our colleague, Emily Heaton, um, who's just rejoined us here in the crop sciences department. Um, so on the left, is the, the corn, which again does not do well under these waterlogged soil conditions, but the miscanthus is thriving. 
And another benefit of our perennial grasses um, is that they can maintain high productivity without fertilizer nitrogen inputs. So this is um, data from a meta-analysis uh, across all of the Miscanthus uh, trials that have been conducted over about a decade prior to the publication of this uh, study. Um, where it, um, on the x-axis, you can see fertilization rates on the y-axis is the biomass yield of the Miscanthus. And obviously there's a lot of variability here that we're, we're trying to, to figure out. Um, but uh, what I want you to notice is that even under no fertilization, there can be very high uh, yields of miscanthus. And this is due to nutrient retranslocation um, prior to senescence of the miscanthus. Um, and um, uh, we're also now doing some studies to look at uh, nitrogen fixation that can occur um, with uh, uh, bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria associating with Miscanthus. Um, so with, within CAVI, um, CAVI is one of four bioenergy, bioenergy research centers uh, that are funded by the Department of Energy. Um, and the overall goal of the bioenergy research uh, program um, is to develop the science technology and knowledge base necessary to enable sustainable cost-effective production of advanced biofuels and bioproducts from non-food plant biomass in support of a new bio-based economy. So within CAVI, we're organized in three um, separate but integrated research themes. Uh, the feedstock production theme is developing more productive, resilient, and sustainable crops that produce oil and other high value products. The conversion theme is pioneering synthetic biology to develop microbes that create new chemicals and upgrade plant products. And then I'm part of the sustainability theme, which is optimizing the economic value and environmental benefits of bioenergy and bioproducts. Within the sustainability theme, we're tackling uh, several major scientific challenges. Um, and my group is um, involved with the one highlighted here, uh, the limited understanding of ecosystem processes related to carbon, nitrogen, and water cycling to enable predictions of ecosystem services and yield. So while the title of my talk was very broad in terms of plant microbe interactions um, in relation to sustainability, um, my talk will re really focus on um, nitrogen cycling, but my group also does work on uh, carbon cycling as well. So there's many ways in which microbes can influence the sustainability of bioenergy crops and landscapes. Um, we, the microbes can enhance sustainability by improving crop yields, um, I mentioned nitrogen fixation, um, which can enhance nutrient availability to the crops. Micro association with mycorrhizal fungi um, and, and the crops can also uh, improve uh, nutrient transfer to the crops. Um, something that is not a focus of CABI, but is being investigated by other bioenergy research centers um, is the ability of uh, microbes to boost plant defenses against pathogens and herbivores and also enhance plant tolerance. Uh, against stresses such as drought. Um, microbes uh, can also mitigate climate change through contributing to soil carbon persistence. So um, as they uh, assimilate carbon into their bodies, they die and the microbial necromass can get uh, attached to mineral surfaces in the soil and essentially um, get stabilized um, to some degree um, as mineral associated organic matter. And there are some microbes that can consume nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, um, before it's released to the atmosphere. And that's um, another uh, big interest of my, my lab group. Now, microbes can also uh, detract from the sustainability of our bioenergy cropping systems because they do compete with the crops for nitrogen and other nutrients. Um, but importantly, um, and what's a major focus of my talk today is um, their contribution to water pollution. So there are um, specific groups of microbes that um, called nitrifiers who convert ammonium to nitrate, which is highly soluble so that it can leach from soil um, after uh, rain events. And um, the nitrification process also produces nitrous oxide as an intermediate that can be released to the atmosphere. The nitrate produced through nitrification can also be denitrified um, to produce nitrous oxide. 
Um, so, so this nitrification process is a really key process in the soil nitrogen um, uh, cycle that can really influence the sustainability of, of our uh, cropping systems. And the microbes can also, um, they, they also mineralize soil organic carbon to carbon dioxide. So, so there is heterotrophic respiration um, that is uh, releasing some of that uh, soil organic carbon that would otherwise uh, be persist in soils for a longer time. Now, in terms of plant microbe interactions, there's many different direct and inter indirect interactions between plants and microbes. And I'll start with one that we often don't think about, which is the modification of the soil microclimate. Um, so the above ground canopy architecture and also the, the presence of a litter layer on the soil surface uh, can alter soil temperature and moisture, um, which, can, um, uh, which we know are major controls on microbial activity. Um, and the water use efficiency of the plant and also the root distribution of, of the crops um, also influence the spatial patterns of soil moisture um, that can uh, contribute not only to um, uh, the, the moisture needed by the microbes to survive, but also the movement of substrates to the microbes. The input of above ground residues and also uh, below ground uh, litter in the form of roots uh, return nutrients to the soil. And the carbon to nitrogen ratio of uh, both types of litter um, influence the carbon use efficiency of the microbes. And that, that is um, one of the um, key regulators of how much carbon uh, stays in the microbial biomass and can get stabilized in the soil um, as microbial necromass um, or gets respired by microbes um, as carbon dioxide that's released to the atmosphere. And this litter is also uh, represents a carbon substrate to the microbes to fuel uh, the heterotrophic microbial activity. Um, as I mentioned, this is probably the most obvious is a direct competition uh, between plants and microbes uh, for different nutrients. And um, something that's really challenging to study, um, but I guess in my group, we love a good challenge um, is uh, root exudation of specific compounds that can inhibit particular uh, microbial processes. Um, there are also some compounds that are chelators that can release nutrients to make them available to the plants, but obviously some of those nutrients can, can be taken up by the microbes. Um, and then um, some of the compounds released by roots, um, just simply as being a form of organic carbon, um, can stimulate the heterotrophic processes. And so for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus in on this one bullet point, the specific metabolites that can inhibit specific processes such as nitrification. Um, so uh, biomass sorghum is a high yielding grass um, that is managed in annual rotation with soybeans. Um, and you might've, uh, there's a lot more research done on grain sorghum, um, but biomass sorghum is uh, bred to have uh, photoperiod sensitivity that makes it um, not, uh, that delays its flowering so that it essentially just keeps growing until um, the first frost kills it. Um, so you can see with my postdoc, Mark Burnham here, the, the sorghum gets quite tall. Uh, Mark is not that short. <laughs> He's actually quite a tall fellow. Um, so uh, as you can imagine with the high winds that we get around here, um, the, the sorghum, often would, if, if we just let it keep growing until first frost would blow over and it would become very difficult to harvest um, uh, crops that are lying horizontally on the ground. So we usually uh, harvest before, before first frost. Um, and uh, I'm showing some biomass yield data here from a uh, CABI investigator, uh, DK Lee's group, um, where they were doing a, a fertilization trial because biomass sorghum, um, there's just not as much, um, uh, history of uh, agronomic trials on biomass sorghum compared to grain sorghums. And so um, it was interesting to see here that even without fertilization, the biomass sorghum across these four different hybrids that were tested can maintain fairly high yields of around 20 uh, tons per hectare. Um, so uh, Many different plants uh, can exude uh, root exudates that can alter the microbial community composition and activity related to different parts of the soil nitrogen cycle. 
And the red lines here um, come from the, are, are drawn out from the roots out to uh, different functional genes that are related to different steps of these uh, nitrogen cycling processes. And again, what we're interested in is nitrification because uh, it, through multiple enzymatic steps takes ammonium uh, to the form of nitrate, which is very susceptible to loss from the ecosystem. And there are many plants that can exude compounds capable of biological nitrification inhibition or BNI. And this has been tested in the laboratory um, where, um, so I've, I've uh, highlighted here sorghum. Um, uh, in, in the top part of this table, there are many different pasture grasses um, which have uh, some level of, of BNI, whereas when we look at the cereal crops, it's sorghum of, of the ones that are tested. You can see maize here um, didn't have any uh, BNI capability. And across the legume crops, there's also some variability. So it's not, so while many plants can exude BNI compounds, they don't all exude BNI compounds. And so we're, uh, we're interested in um, this uh, BNI capability of sorghum um, because it, it's um, different from our um, typical bioenergy crops because it's grown as an annual crop and therefore um, uh, has more uh, potential to lead to nitrogen losses because we, we do fertilize it. Um, so in the previous uh, study that I just showed, um, they also tested different genotypes of the same plant species and found that there's not only variability in BNI uh, capability across different plant species, but also within the same plant species. So this is a tropical um, pasture grass. And um, on the x-axis here, you see the, the BNI activity of the, the roots or the, the root exudate that was collected from the roots. So you can see that it actually, um, across these different uh, seven different genotypes, it spans from very low BNI activity to, to much higher BNI activity. Um, and we're also wondering because um, in, in conjunction with GK's uh, questions about how much fertilizer we should add um, to sorghum to maximize the yields. Um, we're wondering how BNI interacts with that fertilization rate, because um, uh, just from first principles, we know that the, the production of BNI compounds should be energetically costly to the plant. Um, so if there is more fertilizer nitrogen available, then presumably we would have lower BNI occurring at the higher fertilization rates. And so we would end up with this uh, nonlinear uh, increase in nitrogen losses um, uh, with fertilization rate that could be uh, contributed in part by um, the, the change in the magnitude of BNI um, by, by the sorghum. So, uh, we, so we had three questions um, about biological nitrification inhibition by sorghum. Um, as I mentioned, the previous studies on BNI have mostly be do been done in the laboratory setting. And so we weren't sure if BNI is actually detectable um, in the field setting. Um, we also didn't know if, uh, we want to know if the magnitude of BNI varies among sorghum genotypes, um, in part because we, we do have um, an amazing resource um, on campus here with um, a collection of um, nearly 800 different sorghum genotypes in a diversity panel that we could select from uh, to, to um, find genotypes that might have uh, higher BNI capabilities um, that we could then uh, uh, breed into an improved uh, sorghum uh, hybrid. And so um, the last question was, does high soil nitrogen uh, availability from fertilizer inhibit BNI so that um, we would, uh, when we're deciding on the optimal fertilizer application rate, um, we can consider the, the contribution of BNI um, at the lower fertilization rates um, to, to help keep ammonium in the soil for, for the plants to take up. So in 2018, um, Mark, in, in collaboration with DK Lee's group, uh, set up a field trial. Um, DK um, was interested in the four biomass sorghum hybrids, and he was testing across four fertilization levels. Um, but we focused in on um, two fertilization levels. 
Um, so you can see here um, that we were um, pulling up individual uh, sorghum plants and uh, collecting the rhizosphere soil off of the plants. And so rhizosphere soil is, um, has the, the very technical definition of being the soil we can shake off of the roots of the plants. So that's the, the soil that's um, associated with the roots. Um, and the way we assessed uh, BNI was by comparing potential nitrification rates in this rhizosphere soil that's uh, strongly influenced by the root exudates uh, compared to the bulk soil that is uh, more physically distant from the rhizosphere and therefore more likely to, to not be influenced by the BNI compounds released from sorghum. So wherever you see that brown bar um, separating from the green bar, um, suggests that there was BNI happening. So typically we would expect that green bar to have, uh, to be lower, to have lower potential nitrification um, because of the BNI compounds inhibiting um, nitrification. So um, in this early growing season date, uh, across the four hybrids that were tested, we saw only uh, one genotype um, that had, uh, that expressed uh, BNI, whereas the other three genotypes uh, ha had not yet. Um, and we didn't see genotypic differences in BNI uh, at any other, any other sampling date in the growing season. Um, so this suggests to us that at least uh, for the four hybrids that we were looking at, um, that there wasn't too much genotypic uh, variation within sorghum with respect to BNI. Um, we did see, um, as we hypothesized, a suppression of BNI by fertilizer application. So um, on the left side here, in the absence of fertilizer application, we saw a 27% um, effect, a reduction of potential nitrification in the rhizosphere compared to the bulk soil. Um, and we saw only a 12% reduction um, in um, this potential nitrification rate uh, when we fertilized at 168 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, so this is um, telling us that, um, that it, it seems that the fertilizer application could be inhibiting um, BNI, uh, but we weren't sure if what that, um, if there was a threshold amount of uh, fertilizer application that caused a suppression or if there might be some sort of um, curvilinear relationship uh, between fertilizer application rate and BNI. So in 2019, um, in the second year of DK's trial, um, because we didn't see any genotypic variation or much genotypic variation in the first year, we focused in on one um, uh, hybrid and uh, did our study across the four fertilization levels that DK had set up in the field. And of course, right, when you do your, when you do your study over two years, you get different results in the two years. Um, so in 2019, we saw that fertilizer application did not affect BNI. Um, so um, if you focus in on this August date in the middle, where we saw the strongest BNI effect, so the green bar is separating from the brown bar the most, um, we see that a similar separation of those two bars, so a similar uh, inhibition of nitrification in the rhizosphere across all four um, fertilization levels. And we think that that might be due to the drier soil conditions that happen in the mid-growing season in 2019 compared to 2018. Um, so we didn't get much rainfall um, during the mid-growing season in, in 2019. And when we looked at the ammonium and nitrate concentrations in the rhizosphere soil versus the bulk soil, um, what was interesting is that in 2018, those concentrations were relatively similar between bulk and rhizosphere soil. So that suggests that with the higher soil moisture, there's fairly rapid movement of um, the fertilizer, ammonium and nitrate from the bulk soil into the rhizosphere, kind of drawn there by, by plant demand and also by diffusion. Um, whereas in 2019, under the dry so drier soil conditions, we saw a disconnect between the bulk and rhizosphere soil. Um, where, with uh, much lower ammonium and nitrate concentrations in the rhizosphere soil where, where the plant is um, uh, uh, drawing up a lot of the, the ammonium and nitrate compared to the bulk soil where, where we could see the fertilizer nitrogen sitting there 
um, but it wasn't um, able to move through that drier soil into the rhizosphere soil quite as well as um, under the moister soil conditions in 2018. So what that tells us is that um, while we can um, study the BNI uh, uh, capabilities of plants under laboratory conditions, in the field, we have variable uh, environmental conditions, um, most importantly, variable soil moisture that can affect the movement of ammonium and nitrate and also the BNI compounds um, to impact the magnitude of the BNI effect that we see. Um, what was nice though, was that across both of our study years, we did see that, um, we did see one consistent uh, pattern, which was that uh, the uh, BNI by sorghum peaked in the mid-growing season. Um, so this is um, in, in the July date. Um, and uh, this, this effect was stronger um, under the drier soil conditions in 2019. And um, again, we think that um, this has to do with the movement of the BNI compounds um, through, through or, or the lack of movement of the BNI compounds through dry soil, drier soil. So those BNI compounds were essentially more, con remained more concentrated in the rhizosphere. Um, so we were able to detect a stronger um, uh, BNI signal in, in 2019. Um, so you might be wondering, well, the suppression of nitrification in the rhizosphere compared to the bulk soil, is that just um, due to plant competition with the nitrifiers for the ammonium? So the, the nitrification rates are lower simply because the microbes are um, limited by ammonium availability. So Mark also did a, a separate study where he had grew um, sorghum and maize um, side by side and measured the um, BNI that was occurring um, again across uh, similar dates across the growing season and saw that there was um, greater BNI occurring in, in uh, sorghum fields compared to the maize fields. And so this suggests to us that BNI is, is not simply a result of the plants out competing the nitrifiers, but that there is this separate direct effect of the BNI compounds being exuded by the roots. Um, because we know that, we know that the modern uh, maize hybrids that we work with um, do not produce these BNI compounds. Um, although you will note that, that there, is, there is some effect of this plant competition with nitrifiers, right? So, so we do see that the green bars are lower um, in, the, in the maize compared to the, to the brown bars representing the bulk soil. It's just that there, we see a greater difference in, in the sorghum. So there's um, an, an additional suppression of nitrification due to the BNI compounds in the sorghum fields. So um, to summarize uh, the, the field work that uh, Mark did um, in response to the three questions that we had posed to begin with, um, we found that BNI by sorghum uh, occurs in the field, but the magnitude of the BNI effect depends on plant phenology with, with BNI peaking in the mid-growing season um, when plant demand for nitrogen is the highest. And, um, and this BNI effect also depends on soil moisture conditions. And among the four biomass sorghum hybrids that we tested, BNI differed only in the early growing season when there was only the one hybrid that expressed BNI. And having talked with our colleagues in the feedstocks theme of CABI, um, we now understand um, that, that um, from, from their understanding of the molecular biology, that this makes sense that those, um, the genes that are responsible um, for the production of the BNI compounds um, are not expressed um, until um, later in the growing season. Um, and lastly, we found that the fertilizer effect on BNI depends on soil moisture with the drier soil conditions leading to a disconnect in nitrogen availability and also the movement of the BNI compounds um, uh, in the rhizosphere versus the bulk soil. So this got us really excited about uh, the potential for BNI to, um, for, for us to um, 
either uh, breed or engineer or have our colleagues in the feedstocks theme breed or engineer sorghum uh, to have higher BNI so that we can uh, reduce the nitrogen losses that occur under our, um, our, or sorghum, our sorghum, which is grown as an annual crop. Um, so this led us to wonder, but does BNI impact annual nitrogen losses at the ecosystem scale? And that's a really hard question for us to answer um, uh, empirically uh, because we would need to be able to sample the tile drains um, directly beneath um, our, our plots and to be able to make um, uh, pretty intense measurements of soil nitro nitrous oxide emissions from our sorghum fields. So we turned to our um, other CABI investigators who are ecosystem modelers um, Bill Parton and Melanie Hartman. So Bill Parton is, uh, Parton is well known for having developed uh, the Century and Descent models, um, which are, um, uh, so the Descent is the daily time step version of Century, which is one of the um, leading biogeochemical um, models um, that's used worldwide. And um, we gave them our, um, our empirical data to use to add BNI as an additional uh, parameter within uh, Descent. And so this is showing some of their model output. Um, it's a very pretty rainbow color. I ask you to just focus on these um, uh, three bars on the right here, um, which are showing uh, that these top two bars um, that are circled together in blue are um, with 150 uh, pounds per acre of nitrogen added um, with no BNI occurring versus the measured amount of BNI that we observed. And you can see that there was no real impact on nitrate leaching at the annual time scale. Now, if Melanie put in a maximum BNI rate of 70% reduction in nitrification, then we do see then in this third bar to the right that there is a dramatic decrease in nitrate leaching. So it seems that if we could increase uh, BNI uh, to consistent 70% reduction in nitrification, then it could make an impact. But at current levels of BNI expressed by sorghum, um, we, we don't see um, a, a major impact on nit nitrate losses. And we think this has to do um, with uh, the timing of BNI initiating um, in the mid-growing season. And that's after this uh, fertilizer-induced pulse of nitrification has already dissipated. So there's, there's a mistiming there of, of um, when the nitrification is inhibited and when the major period of nitrification is occurring. So um, it, while a little bit deflating, um, our, we were excited to have a successful um, modeling measurement integration uh, study. Um, we found that BNI may not be effective for reducing nitrogen losses from rain-fed agroecosystems in the Midwest, where spring rainfall drives a large proportion of annual nitrate leaching prior to um, the, the sorghum growing to uh, the uh, maturity where it's expressing BNI um, and having sufficient root biomass to make BNI matter at the field scale. Um, so I'll end by thanking you for being here and also thanking uh, the many members of my lab who made this research possible and also our many collaborators within CABI. Thank you.